Don't expect Dennis Herb Jr. to send Hudson O'Neill a Christmas card this year. We'll talk about that today. Plus, other top Lucas guys struggle. Chase Johnson threw haymakers at Cole Macedo and nobody noticed. And more from the Dirt Racing Weekend. Let's go. It's Monday, May 15th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. Before we get rolling, today's show is brought to you by Dirt Tracker Plus. When we talk any stats or numbers, talk about trends, or if we go deep on a driver's performance, all of that research for those shows happens through Dirt Tracker Plus. You can access all of the same stats and analytics I do with a subscription. Over at dirttracker.com slash analytics, a lot of stuff in there is free. There's race results. There's a bunch of free stat categories, but you can go even deeper with exclusive analysis and stat tools you will not find anywhere else. That includes driver comparisons. I've got race results and average finish by racetrack and advanced numbers like efficiency and value finishes. If you're creating content, if you work for a series or a track, if you play the pools or fantasy, things like Dirt Draft, this will give you an edge over the competition. A subscription is just $4.99 a month or $49.99 a year. You can cancel anytime. You don't need to send a letter or do smoke signals. You can just go on your account page and hit cancel. Uh, and if you choose the yearly option, it does get you two months for free. Uh, the cool thing is, too, your subscription gets better as you go. I just recently added the Extreme Outlaw Midgets. The High Limit Series will be available here very soon. Right now, there are almost 1,500 races represented. If you want to sign up, click the plus link below in the video description or click plus in the nav bar at dirttracker.com. Oh, we'll start this Monday show off with the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. The Friday show at Farmer City was lost to rain, but they are running it tonight. So you will get some big time at dirt racing later on today if you're down for that. The Saturday show uh, at Fairbury did go on, but they did have a rain delay mixed in. Once the feature got rolling, uh, we ended up with a pretty much drama-filled show. Shannon Babb led the first few from the outside front row before fifth starting Dennis Herb Jr. took over on lap six. Herb looked good out front, maybe good enough to win, uh, but just past halfway following a restart, his night went big sideways. Hudson O'Neill made a bid for the lead into turn one, but it was probably a tad aggressive. Uh, he ended up making contact with Herb, kind of monster trucked over his left front. Herb spun and in the process collected Shannon Babb. Both of those guys, uh, Herb and uh, Babb, tried to continue, but eventually ended up falling out of the race. Herb even tried to maintain the lead for the restart, uh, but was sent to the tail per the Lucas rule because he was the reason for the caution. After the show, Herb barely commented to Dirt on Dirt about what went on, and he was clearly pissed, while O'Neill did take responsibility for the incident. Once rolling again, Pierce took advantage uh, on the ensuing restart to assume the lead, and he held on to the end for $30,000. Not surprising to see Bobby Pierce win at Fairbury. O'Neill had a chance to widen his points lead, but screwed up on the cushion with two to go and absolutely destroyed the Rocket 1. He was credited on the uh, night with a 16th place finish, now falls to second in the standings. The only guy to finish in the top 10 who was also in the top 5 in the standings was Brandon Overton. He went 21st to 4th and now leads the championship by 5 points headed to Farmer City. O'Neill had issues, as did Ricky Thornton Jr. He hit the wall late. Uh, Tim McCready was 14th on the night after a trip to the infield, and Jonathan Davenport was out early and finished DFL. Big hat tip to Dalton Wilson. Uh, he had a 11th to second run. Following tonight at Farmer City, the late model crowd will stick around the Midwest this week for Flow Series races at Marshalltown and Davenport on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, just briefly before we move on to some sprint car stuff, I wanted to double back to the stickman conversation from Friday. There were lots of comparisons to NASCAR spotters when it comes to the stick guys. There are also mentions of Larson needing a spotter on Sundays and, you know, kind of almost people like calling him out for being hypocritical. I do think the stick stuff versus spotters is not quite an apples to apples uh, comparison. Stick guys can't really spot since they're only viewable once a lap. You can't really give your guys information constantly like a spotter can. But I think the where you know this kind of uh, the the stickman kind of play a huge role is in the changing track conditions. An asphalt track changes very little from start to finish in a race, but we all know that's not true in dirt racing. O'Neill jumping high late at Lincoln was a big deal because Shepard had found something on the top, and the leader in that instance has a huge advantage because if the driver doesn't notice that change, the stick guy can point that out for him and he can move to defend, which is exactly what O'Neill did doesn't matter that Shepard later jumped the cushion trying to make something happen, and that's why he didn't win the race. He ran down the Rocket House car from a long way back because of finding the top, and then the race fundamentally changed when O'Neill moved up there to defend. That's why this was a big deal. It's not different than the Saturday feature at something like the Chili Bowl. The first guy to really make moves on top has a big advantage, 
And guys have used the screen to see when that happens to then defend that move. And the shots at Larson for using a spotter on Sundays, I think we're off as well. Let's not forget that Young Money has no problem not having a spotter in a sprint car. I don't feel like that criticism really works out here. I know that signaling isn't going away anytime soon, but that doesn't mean we have to like it. Uh, the Word About Last Sprint Car Series weekend at Williams Grove uh, was cut short Saturday, canceled because of rain. The Friday race was really nothing to write home about unless you're a Brad Sweet fan. He won the dash from the pole uh, and led all 25 laps in the feature from the pole. Nobody could really even get close enough to the Napa 49 to make a move. I do think going forward, it's a big problem for guys like David Gravel and Carson Macedo that Sweet has found speed in central Pennsylvania. It's always been the one big area where the big cat has struggled, but I think it'll be difficult to challenge him for the title if they cannot beat him in PA. Headed to Sharon and Attica next week, Sweet, uh, this week actually, uh, Sweet's lead in the standings is now 36 over Gravel with Macedo 46 back in third. One driver and team note from Pennsylvania, Troy Wagaman Jr. has parted ways with the John Trone owned 39 team. It was just last week that Jeremy Elliott was writing about Wagaman being pleased with the direction of the team, but then Wagaman tweeted the news on Saturday. That came after back-to-back B-Main exits against the Outlaws at Lincoln and Friday at the Grove. Trone continues to campaign uh, Cameron Smith, and I'm sure this will mean a return to his own car going forward for Wagaman. With the All-Stars of the weekend, we saw wins from Hunter Schoenberg and Tyler Courtney. Schoenberg went flag to flag on Friday at Jacksonville, but Chris Windham and Parker Price Miller did not make it easy. PPM was in the Rudine 26, subbing for Zeb Wise, who is recovering from that concussion suffered the weekend before at Eldora. PPM was probably in line for a good finish, but made a mistake at a four and spun out. He did drive back through the field to finish 10th. He was also 10th on Saturday at Wilma and will remain in the 26 tomorrow night with high limit. That Saturday show at Wilmot was dominated by Sunshine. He got to the lead on lap 10 and drove on to a six-second victory. He just absolutely knifed his way through lap traffic. He leaves the weekend with a 42-point advantage in the standings. And I think the rest of the field here could be in big trouble for this title. We really need somebody like Schoenberg or Will, uh, Wyndham to really step up here and try to challenge Sunshine. Wyndham did have a fantastic weekend. He finished second both nights, really starting to look comfortable with the wing on. Hopefully that trend continues. That McCandless 29 car as well uh, that PPM vacated last week was in attendance. They had Cy Lynch in the seat. He had weekend finishes of 14th and 6th. One driver who I keep waiting on for uh, for them to kind of turn things around in 2023 is Ryan Timms. Uh, I kind of put him in my notes a whole bunch of times here, and I keep kind of cutting it out. But at some point, like, these guys got to do something. He made a nice splash debuting against the Outlaws last season. They had finishes of 9th and 2nd in their first two starts. But this season has been a struggle. 12 outlaw starts with a best finish of 14th at US 36. A lot of B and C main results along the way. Friday night at Jacksonville, a track he won at just a few weeks before. He ended up 19th against the All-Stars. Definitely some work to do for those guys going forward. Later this week, the All-Stars take on Outlaw, Fonda, and Weed Sport up in the Northeast. Out in California, the Dominic Selzy vs. Corey Day show continued with the NARC Sprint Cars. They split the two nights of the Peter Murphy Classic at Hanford, with Day winning Friday night over James McFadden, and then Selzy striking on Saturday for the big cash. Day tried to run him down late in that finale, but did run out of the laps. In his first weekend away from the Outlaws, McFadden picked up two podium results. He will be in action tomorrow against High Limit. In that second Roth car, Buddy Kofoid was six on Friday, but had issues on Saturday night, was out early in the feature. He's also on the high limit entry list. Uh, just a little bit ago, tweeted that he'll be in the Indy Race Parts 71 on Tuesday. Day continues to lead the NARC Championship by 19 points right now over Dominic Selzy. The one thing from the NARC weekend I was surprised about was how little attention the Chase Johnson Cole Macedo incident got. In that Friday feature, Macedo, Johnson, and Selzy were battling pretty hard for position. Macedo, after kind of battling down the backstretch, dove low into turn three and ended up wiping out Johnson. Johnson's car just spun out, but Macedo actually went for a tumble. As Macedo was kind of gathering himself in the car, he was met with a hail of punches from Johnson. Uh, Johnson got in quite a few shots before safety workers pulled him away, and then the kerfuffle kind of grew later when crew guys came out onto the track and got involved. There was more kind of pushing and shoving. Johnson wasn't allowed to restart the race afterwards, which seemed like a screw up on his part. He could have easily driven back into the top 10, especially, uh, especially since his car didn't appear to be damaged. But obviously, he clearly felt the need to send Macedo a message and got out of his car. And because he got out of his car, the NARC officials wouldn't let him get back in. 
I don't know what else led up to that incident because I don't feel like you just go after a guy like that over just a single issue. I was also surprised how little pub the whole thing got. I'm guessing because it happened so late at night, you know, that whole kind of sprint cars after dark thing. If you want to see all of what went down, I'll link below in the description to Cali Dirt video on YouTube. He's got the whole thing, including drone footage. You get right up close and personal with all of it. One final thing for you today. Apparently, the ASCS has been dropped from Flow Racing. Series owner Terry Maddox tweeted this morning, quote, Unfortunately, the ASCS will not be broadcast on Flow Racing for the foreseeable future. We are working to rectify the situation as quickly as possible, unquote. No mention anywhere as to why or when another streaming option will be available. This might just be another example of Flow moving on from some of their lower performing deals. We've seen it a bunch already in 2023. Tracks and series dropped. And Flow's really starting to focus only on those certain dirt racing events that, you know, kind of move the needle for them. And then they're expanding into other verticals like drag racing and pavement stuff. Uh, we'll keep you posted on where ASCS lands in the future. That's it for the show today. Uh, make sure to check out the streaming schedule over at dirttracker.com slash watch tonight. Hope you guys have a good Monday out there. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.